Thank you for joining us on this beautiful day. Um, back in the fall, I think it was, Kathy Reed reached out to me and said that she had been so impressed by one of Ron's presentations in some kind of a faculty context and that we needed to bring him to the ath so he could speak to a larger group. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our newest faculty colleague, Ron Lipskin Hadas. Did I say it right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me just ask, um, can you hear me in the back of the room if I don't use the microphone? Great. I prefer not to. Great. Um, so first of all, Priya, thank you so much for uh, organizing this, David and that staff, Kathy for instigating this, and frankly, all of you for such a warm welcome to CMC. I was really enjoying my first months here and looking forward to lots of exciting months in years ahead. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research, um, just briefly. Um, and so let me begin um, with another acknowledgement, which is to my many students who've done research with me over the years. So much of what I'll be telling you about today is research that um, I did with undergraduates, primarily at Harvey Mudd, but some other schools as well, um, and um, many of them um, resulted in publications, and of course, the National Science Foundation, um, which has um, funded this work for um, years. Actually, today's story begins with an acknowledgement of a different kind, which is the acknowledgement of the enormous number of species on this planet. Um, by most estimates, there's been like two million known species on the planet, that Many, many more that haven't been discovered yet. They're being discovered at an incredible rate, in the order of thousands of species per year. Now, that's us discovering them. That doesn't mean that they are actually coming to be species in each year. Um, and so the planet is very large. The oceans are very deep. Um, and so species are being discovered each year. And in fact, uh, in 2021, this Easter egg eagle was discovered. Um, all right, tell me, is this okay in terms of volume? All right, I'll try not to yell. Um, bark scorpion was discovered in Guatemala. Um, a shark um, was discovered in New Zealand, kind of an um, iridescent glowing shark. Um, in fact, um, as I mentioned, there's literally uh, on the order of 2 million known species, about 6,000 mammals, 10,000 birds, 10,000 reptiles, 1.3 million invertebrates. At uh, the turn of the last century, a group of British theologians asked the famous British biologist J.B.S. Haldane, what does the study of biology tell us about the nature of our creator? And he said, an inordinate fondness for beetles. As it turns out, as it turns out, about a quarter of all known species, including plants, um, all known species are beetles. 350,000 plus species. It's amazing. And so this has been kind of a mystery in the science community. Why is it that there are so many species of beetles? And it turns out that this question was largely answered in a paper in 1998 by um, a biologist at Harvard named Brian Farrell. And basically the explanation is this. About 200 million years ago, the conditions on Earth were ideal for the blossoming of plant life, particular flowering plants, angiosperms. And those angiosperms, um, benefited from having pollinators. And it turns out there were a lot of beetles on the planet as well, and those beetles were very good pollinators. So as the flower species were radiating, plant life in general was radiating, um, beetles became specialized to those flowering plants. And in fact, it was kind of a mutual uh, evolution. It was called coevolution, meaning that the flowers would develop uh, different kinds of traits, characters, that would attract certain species of beetles, and the beetles would developed traits that made them very good pollinators. It's kind of this mutual evolution. And in fact, um, Darwin himself wrote about this in The Origin of Species. He wrote, I can understand how a flower and a bee might slowly become either simultaneously or one after the other, modified and adapted in the most perfect manner to each other by the continued preservation of individuals presenting mutual and slightly favorable deviations of structure. So this kind of idea that they are evolving in tandem, a very powerful idea, really prescient. He was imagining this based on his observations, but he really had no way to prove this, um, but it was rather amazing. So now we understand this much better, um, and there's different kinds of kind of coevolutionary systems. And here I'm just imagining just 
two species, but in fact it gets more complex than this. In some cases the system is more complex. But generally speaking, we'll just think for now about two species, and it might be mutualistic, like flowers and bees, or beetles and angiosperms, or it might be parasitic, kind of an arms race between a host and a parasite, and the host is evolving defenses against the parasite, and the parasite is evolving uh, adaptations to, to be a, a better parasite on that host. So in general, this notion of coevolution is two species, it could be more actually, exerting selective pressure on each other and evolving in a response to each other. It turns out that to understand how this actually works really relies on the notion of evolutionary trees. Um, so you've probably seen diagrams like this in your ninth grade biology books and elsewhere, kind of the tree of life, or this is a part of it. And we're going to talk more about that. In fact, this idea of an evolutionary tree appears in Darwin's notebooks. He probably wasn't the first, but he was among the first. And so here's a sketch in his notebooks from 1837 of such an evolutionary tree. You may have read just a couple of weeks ago that these notebooks were actually missing from the Cambridge University Library for two decades. Um, and it was, it was a huge loss. In fact, my son and I went to this library um, about 10 years ago. We were hoping to see this, and it was like there was a placard there. These have been stolen. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, um, someone left them in a little pink bag in a corner of the library where there were no cameras, um, and there was a card inside that was Happy Easter. They were returned intact. Uh, rather amazing. Um, that phylogenetic tree, or evolutionary tree, by the way, is uh, kind of iconic. You can find it on beer glasses, necklaces, tattoos. I was once giving a talk at the University of Connecticut, and um, a graduate student pulled up her uh, sleeve and showed me that she had this on her arm. Um, so evidently, quite a popular tree. So, how do you infer these trees in the first place? Well, um, for many years, for quite some time, it was done based on sort of characters, attributes, physical observable characters. Um, and so for example, you might imagine three species, humans, say bats and birds. And you might say, well, based on wings, the fact that bats and birds both have wings, they must have had a more recent common ancestor than with humans. Um, or you might have a different, if you consider other characters like mammary glands and fur, um, you might develop a different hypothesis. Um, this one may seem compelling, but it turns out to be wrong. Um, humans are more closely related to bats than, um, than bats. Um, bats are cl more closely related to humans than they are to, to birds. Um, and so it turns out that this kind of mechanism, while useful to some extent, um, has not surprisingly been improved upon considerably with the advent of new technologies. And those are technologies both in sequencing the genome and in the computational methods that allow us to infer these trees. And so these are what we call phylogenetic trees. They're based on genetic data. And so the idea here is that we look at a bunch of species um, that we believe are related. In fact, all species are, but let's just look at a subset of life forms. These are um, some um, some sponges, um, and we sequence their DNA, their DNA, and we look for regions of the DNA where there are similarities, and then based on various kinds of computational methods, we can infer putative evolutionary trees, what are called phylogenetic trees. Um, this one right here is for a um, sponge that was found in Borneo a few years ago, a new species, and when you find a new species, discover a new species, you can name it yourself. So this one was called Spongiforma squarepansi. Um, <laughs> here is, in fact, the paper, Spongiforma squarepansi, a new species of gastroebolite from Borneo, 2011. Um, OK, so I mentioned this idea of coevolution of pairs of species. And I suggested that it has something to do with these evolutionary trees. So let me tell you more. Here are two species that we believe have coevolved. These are figs, the cross-section of a wild fig, and this is the fig wasp that pollinates it. Now, don't be alarmed. It's not nearly that big. There it is right there on, the, on a human finger. Um, but let me just tell you the story of these figs and the wasps. So it turns out that um, in the wild, these figs, in which there's many hundreds of species, are, um, are pollinated by fig wasps. And it's been observed quite some time that every species of fig, wild fig, seems to have a different species of wasp that pollinates it, which is highly suggestive that there was some kind of coevolution, that there was a specialization that occurred. But only with the advent of these modern techniques have we been able to demonstrate how this might have happened. So first thing that they did was they sequenced the DNA of the fig, and they built an evolutionary tree, a phylogenetic tree for figs. And this is just a section, just a small part of the whole. I'll show you a larger tree of all known wild figs. And here are the wasps. And what you can see here at the tips, the 
sort of branches of these trees, if you will. These are the currently living species, the observed species. Everything else back here are inferred ancestral lineages. We don't know for sure, but that's what we believe it looks like based on these techniques. And I'm not going to even talk about the techniques for how these trees are inferred. That in itself is a very rich area of research. And here, similarly, is the one for the wasps. And you can see the association. This fig is pollinated by this wasp. This fig has two wasps that pollinate it, and so on and so forth. Actually, I have to take a quick aside here, because it's a really bizarre story about the pollination um, in, this, in this life cycle. Here's what happens. Uh, for the most part, each species of uh, fig has a different wasp species that pollinates it. A female wasp finds the kind of fig that she's looking for, and she burrows her way in. And it's generally a one-way trip. She loses her wings and um, much of the external um, structure and her body on her way in. Then she deposits her lar larvae using this ovipositor, which is just, just the right length to sort of deposit her larvae inside what are called the florets, the flowers, if you will, which are on the inside of this fig. Um, then she generally dies. And the offspring, the male and female offspring, then have this uh, fig uh, to, to operate in. And what happens is the males um, mate with the females. The males don't have wings, incidentally. Uh, many of them end up living, inside, the dying, living and dying inside the fig. The females, or sisters, then leave the fig and they repeat the life cycle. So when you crunch into a wild fig, you should know uh, what you're eating. However, I will tell you that uh, domesticated figs are self-pollinating, so you don't have to worry about that. And the crunch, by the way, is actually not the wasp anyhow. <laughs> um, all right, so here are the two trees, the phylogenetic trees, the associations which have been identified through field work. And what we want to know is how might they have co-evolved. And to do that, what we're interested in doing is essentially mapping this tree, this is the symbiont in this case, the wasp onto this tree to understand what may have happened. And so here is one possible uh, mapping. And what you can see here is this dark one here is the fig and the light one inside is the wasp. And you can see there's these weird events that happen. These events that happen are like um, a ancestral wasp switched to a different lineage of fig or co-speciated or something else or different kinds of evolutionary events that we can map. But this is, off, this is one uh, possible scenario by which they have co-evolved. Here is a host parasite system. This is, um, I was going to say near and dear, but that might not be quite the right choice of words. But it is something that I observe a lot because I have these guys in my backyard. Um, and these are pocket gophers. And these are the lice that parasitize them. And you can see we've done the same kind of thing, built the phylogenies. Identify, oh, look at that. It's amazing. It's like every species of pocket gopher has a distinct species of louse that infests it, parasitizes it, highly suggestive of coevolution. And again, we want to try to find the mapping of the parasite onto the host to understand evolutionarily what happened here. This happens in a lot of systems. Here's one of uh, two birds, um, that, uh, or two sets of birds that um, one parasitizes the other. It turns out in this case, what happens is that these indigo birds um, parasitize the finches by having evolved um, egg um, markings that look just like the host um, that they, they parasitize, and so they deposit their eggs in the other species' nests, and the, the finches then um, tend to those eggs and actually even feed their young, and this is a great trick if you can pull it off. Like, you like, leave your kids someplace else and somebody else takes care of them. All right, so again, how did this happen? So, in a nutshell, kind of here is the, uh, the scenario. We have a phylogenetic tree for one species, the host we'll call it, and then for another. We get this from DNA extraction and various computational methods. Field work associates the currently living species, the, what we call the currently living taxa, which uh, symbiont or parasite lives on this host, and so on and so forth. And then we're trying to find a mapping of this tree onto this tree that is the best. Well, what do we mean by the best? Well, there's a mathematical objective function that measures the quality of a mapping. And to a first order approximation is how many weird, evolutionarily weird things do you have to offer to explain that? Like ideally, if there's perfect coevolution, the trees look exactly identical. Every time one thing speciated, so did the other, the trees would superimpose perfectly and you would need no weirdness at all to explain that the cost would be zero. But generally speaking, that's not how things work. And so you associate some kind of numerical cost with each of these events. And it's an optimization problem. You try to find an optimal mapping. And so this is quickly a computational mathematical problem. Um, 
here is the solution to that problem, two different solutions, it turns out, for gophers and lice, where you can see these kinds of weird events that are being used to explain the differences between the two trees. All right? So the problem, the first problem here, is find a mapping of the symbiont, or parasite, onto the host of minimum total cost, where you associate cost with the different kinds of events. And it's actually not that we want to find a reconciliation. We actually want to find something more general. We want to find an algorithm a technique for doing this in general because this problem arises all the time and what we want is an algorithmic tool that will do it. So let's talk about algorithms for a moment, short aside. The algorithms that we kind of think about, that we hear about in the press, are mainly machine learning algorithms. They're algorithms that attempt to learn from data and then to make predictions. That's actually not the kind of algorithm that we're thinking about here. What we're thinking about here is what's called a optimization algorithm or a combinatorial algorithm. We're not learning anything. We're just trying to optimize for something. And so it's a mathematical algorithm, but it's still nonetheless computational. So it's this kind of algorithm that we are thinking about. Now, in the space of algorithms, some are fast and some are slow. And by fast, we have some very specific mathematical ways of describing what that means, explaining what that means, but let's talk about slow for a moment. It turns out that many of the kinds of problems we're interested in, we don't know of fast algorithms for them. The best algorithms have a number of steps which grows exponentially with the size of the problem. Like the problem might be the number of species. If you have 100 species, like 2 to the 100, that's exponential. Let me just tell you that 2 to the 300 is the number of particles in the known universe. So if you have an algorithm that grows exponentially, then the number of steps is going to be required basically the number of particles in the known universe. Quantum computers are not going to help you. You could harness every quantum computer, let's say 100 years from now, and you can, you can do sort of the theoretical calculations. Every quantum computer that might exist 100 years from now and all the classical computers, the sun will burn out before you'll have a chance to solve these problems. So we literally need these efficient algorithms. Unfortunately, for some of the problems we're interested in, we can actually prove that there's no better solution than exponential, essentially. We can prove they're probably hard. And like, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a theory called NP-hardness, which is uh, at the crux of theoretical computer science. When possible, we hope for these. On occasion, we get these. And so when we get these, we're super excited because we have algorithms that can actually be used to solve these problems. When we get these, we're less excited, but that invites us to use different kinds of techniques that give us almost optimal solutions. And there's a whole field of approximation algorithms that we use to do that. You may have heard of some of these problems, the traveling salesman problem, classic, um, graph coloring, um, and others. Okay, so let me just tell you about some of the problems that we're working on. The first problem I mentioned earlier was the problem basically of given two phylogenetic trees and an association of their extant taxa, the currently living species, find the least cost, the best mapping uh, of those two trees, which is a mathematical sort of I, I kind of I, um, sort of idealization of like, what may have happened biologically. Assuming you think that the, mo the best solution is the one that is sort of least cost, it's, a, it's a kind of an ideal. Now, that ideal may not be right. Um, and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to compute the probability of that reconciliation. But if there's a lot of different reconciliations, this is a hard thing to do. So there's algorithmic problems there. Among the many equally good solutions, and by the way, the number can be exponential. You can't even write them all down. Find one that is, in some sense, most representative of the whole. Um, and one of the most recent results that we have is we have effectively solved this problem. And you may say, how could you solve that problem? You said there's an exponential number of possible solutions. You couldn't enumerate them. There's kind of a magic trick, what's a, a kind of a mathematical magic trick that allows us to solve this. Um, and it was a super exciting result. So I'm about, to be, I'm about to conclude here, but let me just share with you what the cycle of research looks like in, in my group. We begin by working with actual biologists to understand the questions that they have in this general space of coevolution. Then we design and analyze and prove the correctness of algorithms on occasion proving the problems we're trying to solve are these hard ones, in which case we then have to approximate them. But ideally, we show that they are solvable efficiently. Then we implement and test those algorithms on actual biologic, biological data. So here's uh, my uh, research group from a few summers ago working on doing some of that. Then, once we have these general purpose algorithms, which can be used for solving lots of different kinds of problems, we work with biologists on specific data sets to make sure that the solutions we're getting are reasonable. Like, we've mathematized this, we've computationalized this, 
Now we have to show it to the biologists and say, do you think the results we're getting are what you were hoping for? And sometimes they say, oh, I can see that something's like fundamentally wrong about this. It makes no sense. Like, OK, let's go back and refine the process. It's iterative. Let's go back and change the model and make sure that we get it right. So we spend a lot of time often in this cycle right here. Ultimately, if the algorithms are good, and on occasion they are, we build actual software tools that we distribute for free to the academic community. Um, and one of those that we uh, have published about a decade ago and continue refining is called Jane. Um, we have several others. And then on occasion, we also publish results, both on the theory and the tools, and sometimes even with biologists on specific data sets. So um, the tool that I mentioned, Jane, um, Jane 3 was the most recent version. Um, it turns out uh, when you Google it, you get an amazing number of hits, like one billion hits. Uh, the disappointing thing is that actual number one is a really good R&B trio called Jane 3. Um, and so you know the solution. When you're competing with something like this, you add some features and you call your software Jane 4. And um, now that's the most popular hit on Jane 4. Um, we use this Jane tool um, with a, a large group of biologists who um, at the time, about eight years ago, uh, sequence the, uh, the genomes of all known figs and wasp species across all continents other than Antarctica, where they don't seem to be found. And they, this is massive amounts of field work. We were sitting in our air-conditioned offices at Harvey Mudd. They were out in Africa in the field and various other places. But ultimately, we used this Jane algorithm to uh, reconcile these to try to understand the most likely co-evolutionary scenarios. And this is it. <laughs> so it's very hard to see, but the black one is the figs, the blue is the wasps, and you can see the mapping here. Oh, I apologize, I see a typo here. We'll fix that later. Okay. Um, but in any case, the results of this research allowed scientists to get new insights into the diversification of both figs and wasps on this planet, and it actually turns out to be really important because um, figs are actually what's called a keystone species, which is, means it's a species that when there's food shortages, this is a food source that's very ubiquitous, very widespread, and can save lots of species from starvation. They can move to this. So it's really important to understand how this happened. Um, we developed many other algorithms. This one's called Xscape. This one was developed with colleagues of mine at the University of Connecticut and MIT. Um, and uh, powerful new ways of getting insights into the space of solutions. It turns out we have bad luck in naming our software. Xscape is also an R&B group, really good. Um, so we're looking for a different name. And let me just come back full circle to Charles Darwin. So Darwin um, himself, I mentioned earlier, had this idea of coevolution that he wrote in his notebooks. Um, and evidently, one of the places that uh, gave him this insight was in his visits to the Galapagos, um, where he saw lots of evidence of this. For example, um, and mockingbirds and the parasites that infest them on the Galapagos. And so in 2011, a group of scientists used our Jane tool um, to understand that coevolution, which gives us this kind of like small connection with Darwin's own writings, which was really exciting for us. And with that, my friends, I will conclude and ask for any questions, comments, or heckles. Thank you so much for your attention. Asima, yeah. Oh, I guess Lou, Eric, and then Asima. Go ahead, Eric. I didn't really understand it that well. Um, so I have a couple of questions about this uncertainty about which mapping works best. Like, is the uncertainty, does that uncertainty come because you don't know what the costs are exactly? Mm. You did understand it very well, Or actually, does Eric. the uncertainty <laughs> come from the fact that when you have the converg the convergence isn't guaranteed of the algorithm because it's an NP hard problem. And how do you get like what's the most probable thing? Where's the probability distribution come from? And what right. does representativeness mean? But other than that, so I don't understand any of that. I don't know. It's those are all profoundly good questions. Um, the fact that you knew to ask those questions suggests that you understood things really well, actually. But so let me let me talk a little bit about that. And I had to obfuscate a lot of these issues because they are really challenging um, and subtle. But let me, just, um, let me just say a couple things about that. So first of all, you're right. There are costs associated with these events. So the events that you might model depend on the biological system under study. But uh, oftentimes, there are things like um, 
uh, what's called duplication, which means one species um, speciates while the other one does not, kind of independent speciation. Another one is um, extinction. Another one is host transfer, where one lineage kind of goes and populates another host lineage. That happens because it's, it's an opportunity to, 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 to send a descendant lineage to, to, uh, over there. And so one of the challenges, as you point out, is to associate numerical costs with those events. And then kind of in a parsimony formulation, you want to find a mapping that minimizes the total cost. But how do you know what those costs are? It turns out that if you look at the literature, people just use certain costs. And they say, we use these costs. Like, you trace that back. Why did you use that cost? Well, because some other paper used that cost. And you trace that back, and it's like, it was arbitrary. It came from like someone's software. And so one of the things that we tried to do was break out of that mold. We offer ways of better estimating those costs. Um, now, it turns out, because those costs are real numbers, there's an uncountably infinite number of combinations of them. And this Xscape work that I did uh, with colleagues actually shows that you can partition the space of costs into equivalence classes where, in a given class, all the costs in this region will give rise to the same solutions. So it, although it doesn't solve the problem entirely, it goes from having an infinite number of possible costs that you might try to a smaller number that you can try. Now, you may ask, like, but which one of those are right? But let me say, yeah, go ahead, Eric. You have a follow-up question. I just want to know why the map necessarily looks like that. Why, like, <laughs> if you move your, if you move like a tiny bit in one direction, you can show that the solution doesn't change very much. That's right. That's like a, I'm amazed that that works. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. That's and a good result. It's a good result. Yeah, okay. yeah, yep. So the uncertainty comes from, the uncertainty comes from uh, needing to know the costs. The uncertainty comes from the fact that um, there are many possible reconciliations that can be equally good. The, rec the, the problem also comes from the fact that phylogenetic trees themselves are not necessarily very robust. There may, be, there may be multiple scenarios for how even a single species evolved. And so trying to factor all those things in to find a one or more reconciliations that are as good as possible is a, is a tricky problem, and so there's a mathematical formulation for that, and it turns out that under certain formulations, you can actually solve that problem efficiently. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, Asima and then Allison, I, I don't know how to order you. I've got to go. Oh, you've got to go, okay. Okay, so, well, I guess, do I, do I have my, now this is awkward. Um, I guess this is a sort of off the wall question, but I guess when I was watching your talk, it's it struck me that one of the biggest challenges facing us right now is actually not diversification, it's the opposite, right? That humans are creating large-scale monocultures of uh, plant life throughout the world uh, and species as well. Um, and in fact, a lot of that species diversity is disappearing. So I was wondering just, is there a way you could use these same tools or apply the principles from those tools to sort of work backwards to identify where we could, um, how, what would be the best targets for trying to re-diversify mm. areas, uh, environments <laughs> that are uh, now less diverse right. than they would have been by natural selection? That's a fantastic question, Allison. Um, thank you for asking. I know you have to run. Um, I will, uh, but as you're walking out, I'll just say, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, um, but it's something, it's, it's, it's really a fascinating thing to ponder. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. I also didn't understand a lot of the technicalities. Um, my question has to do with, um, do, are there biological theories which state that um, minimizing the total cost is what happens in the natural world? Right. Right, so um, where does the, so what's the rationale for minimizing the total cost and cost of what? So for example, if there is a mutual evolution between wasps and figs going on, uh, it's for uh, you know, for for them to reproduce or pollinate, right? That's right. So, wh so what is the cost element in that biological? So, is do species replicate because they are trying to survive, and can that be accommodated by the com computational concepts? That's a great question. So, it, fundamentally, it goes to a principle called Occam's razor, or the principle of maximum parsimony, which is to say, when we're trying to understand how something happened, the explanation that requires the fewest number of sort of steps seems like the most plausible one. So fundamentally, that's what's going on here. And imagine that, forget about cost for a moment, imagine that all events were equal cost. Then we're really talking about how many of these unusual evolutionary events would be required to explain this scenario. That 
would be a, kind of a purely par parsimonious kind of framework. The fact that we adjust things by having different costs is simply to recognize that, that's, that that's, it's too crude to just say that an, an event is an event. Some events are more likely to occur than others. But you can still argue, well, wait a second. Does biology really follow mathematics? Is, does, is, 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 are biological systems really parsimonious? And the answer is no. Um, but to a first order approximation, this gives us some insights. And then we can relax the parsimony constraints. Say, well, what if we allow something that's not quite maximum parsimony? What does that, what, how much does that change the sort of the, um, the explanations that we get? And so we have techniques for doing that too. You know, the alternative is to do something like a, a, a probabilistic model. But there too, you can say, well, uh, how do you, wh why should the most probabilistic, the most highly likely scenario be the right one? The reason for the parsimony framework is A, it's easy to explain, <laughs> easy to think about, easy to reason about, and frankly, it's computationally more tractable than the, the, than the purely probabilistic ones, and so we often use those. But recognizing full well that the explanations that we get are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not definitive. On the other hand, if you can get, if you can over a large space of these different costs and over a large space of solutions, you see that basically all the reconciliations look more or less the same, or they all agree on one part. That gives you a high level of confidence, and so we can compute these sort of confidence values, if you will, or support values to say, there's a lot of evidence to suggest this is what happened because it seems to be robust to all different kinds of perturbations. Yeah, thanks for the question. Hi, Professor. Thanks for giving that talk. I think it was really entertaining. But um, I was really interested in what you had to say about um, Darwin's little passage on coevolution. I was wondering if you're familiar with um, Kropotkin and mutual aid. Um, so that's sort of like a heterodox um, evolutionary theory coming from Russia. Oh, and I yeah, think okay, yeah, yeah. Um, it sort of yeah. relates to the coevolution, but you know, my, con my understanding of it is that it's sort of antithetical to Darwinism and that it emphasizes sort of cooperative and mutual aid elements of animals and human species um, as sort of uh, an antithesis to like the, the, comp the competitive aspects um, emphasized in Darwin. And I was wondering, you know, whether that's reconcilable with this sort of co-evolution theory or? That's a great question. Um, maybe you and I can talk a little bit afterwards. I can ask you some more questions. We'll play a little 20 questions on that. And we'll sure, <laughs> that sounds Thank good. Thank you for the question. Yeah, great question. Mark. So I was curious about the process of how you got your software in the hands of biologists who were interested in using it. How do we get the software into the hands of biologists? Um, so uh, the way that we generally do that is we publish a paper about the software. Um, so there's, there are journals that, um, that have these what are called software articles where you describe the, the software. And then we'll usually publish other papers that are about the algorithms themselves um, and cite those papers of people who are interested. But oftentimes our end users really don't care about the algorithms as long as you tell them what the performance is. But people see them. And then, then, they, and then they start using those tools. And then pretty soon there's a kind of chain reaction. If the tool is good, um, and we just, it's just online. We just, it's, just like it's, on, it's on our website. Um, and so the Jane software has been used in um, something like 350 studies. Um, which is a good number, but it took some time to get there. Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking. Terrell. Uh, I was <clears throat> just particularly interested in the uh, WASP fig uh, flow chart because it seems so extensive, and I just wondered if that can be applied to any other combination of pollinators or uh, parallel symbiosis. Is that something that can be uh, can you look at almonds or uh, tomatoes? Oh, totally. Or, yeah. So mean, every, and, and has that been done, or did you just and did you pick this because it's particularly illustrative? Or, right. So the fig wasp one was just an illustration, but the tool, our tool, has doesn't know about figs or wasps particularly, um, and it's been used in lots and lots of um, different kinds of studies. So another recent one was there was a USDA project where they were looking at the relationship between domesticated avocados in California and in Israel and a particular parasite that was infesting them. And they wanted to understand the coevolution of this parasite with the avocados so they could hopefully develop some interventions. And so they used the tool for that. Um, people have used it for other things. In fact, the, the, one of the most interesting ones, I, I, I'm skeptical about the uh, viability of this, but looking at the evolution of 
computer viruses on software. So they built evolutionary trees of software because you know there's versions. So that's kind of, you can build the evolutionary tree of that and you actually know it because you built it. And then the evolutionary tree of viruses, which you don't know as much about because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a you know, distributed enterprise and trying to understand that. People claim to have used the software to get insights on that. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, but all to say, um, it's really about pairs of systems that evolve in tandem. If you can build evolutionary trees for them, this algorithm says, great, let's do it. Oh, you said um, some species of wasps end up like switching the type of fig species they are. How is that possible without the wasp or the fig going extinct? Hmm. Because the wasps and the figs are highly specialized with each other. Right, so um, this, this is um, sometimes called a host transfer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the biology of this is really interesting and I, I will not claim to understand it fully, but um, oftentimes what happens is this. There's simply a um, there's proximity between two species of, let's say, flowers. Mm -hmm. Let's just imagine um, they're proximate. Um, and um, the bees that are pollinating one species are able to radiate out and start pollinating the other one. But over time, you can imagine that those ecologies might split, they might separate, and it becomes advantageous for the, um, the, for the, for the bee that was pollinating this new species of flower. This, this was originally from the same lineage, to develop some new attributes to become a better pollinator for that. And eventually it's an actual speciation. Mm -hmm. So it can happen in many different ways. Um, that's an that's sort of a, a, a sort of a idealization of one such scenario. But that doesn't mean that the original one has gone extinct. Mm -hmm. It still remains yeah, right. on that population. Yeah. Great talk. Thank um, you. So you're designing software for people that aren't computationally or mathematically inclined. Are there any software design decisions or like human computer interaction things you keep in mind um, to ensure that they're using your software the way you intended to? That's a great question. So let me just repeat the question back to you. Um, because the users aren't necessarily computer scientists and they're not in a, you know, wanting to open the Pandora's box of the algorithms and so forth, how do you provide a tool for them that they actually find useful? So. Um, first of all, we don't do this piece of it very often. I would say maybe once every five or eight years we develop a new piece of software. It takes a while for the algorithms to be sort of validated and for us to gain the confidence of the users that it's going to be valuable for them. When that happens, we release a beta version of a tool. Um, and frankly, you know, I'm not a human factors expert, and so oftentimes these decisions are made like, this seems reasonable, and then we, 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 we test it with a group of users um, who are biologists, and, they, and, we, and we've learned techniques, or I should say I've learned techniques, some people are experts at this, but I've learned techniques of observing them, asking them questions, recognizing like, oh, this is not, this is not quite working, sometimes bringing in a real human factors person to help, and iterating. Um, and so <clears throat> in the most recent tool that we just released about two years ago, um, we definitely made several iterations before our users told us we like this. Um, but you know, we put out there for comment and, and then we just reiterate. Um, yeah, thank you, great question. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, thank you all for being here, I really appreciate it.